I just want to thank the Parkland Institute for inviting me to speak here. Uh, I now live in Missoula, Montana, but I grew up in Calgary since I was five. I, I came with the bums and creeps from Ontario uh, back in the 70s, and um, I really think the Parkland Institute is a, a bright light in a pretty dark province, so I'd like to uh, just thank them for the work that they do. So I, I was supposed to write a book on wolves, but um, I just got uh, so sick and tired of uh, what I perceived to be a pretty um, a dishonest uh, conversation in this country about uh, the nature of the oil sands and um, uh, what we should do about it. Uh, so I decided, I called my publisher and I said, I don't want to write about wolves. I want to, want to, I want to write a book called Little Black Lies. And he was like, all right, go for it. So th this is basically sort of a summary of, uh, of what you might find in the book. And I invite you all to come to the book launch um, tonight at Dewey's. It'll be a little more lighthearted than this. And uh, uh, it'll be a lot of fun. So I'm just quickly going to breeze through. I don't need to give you guys uh, too many details on the nature of the tar sands except that this is one of the most, if not the only honest thing that uh, Stephen Harper has ever said about them, and that it requires vast amounts of capital, broad ding, ding, naggy and technology and an army of skilled workers. And he compared it to the building of the pyramids and uh, the Great Wall of China. Lots of oil worth lots of money. And that, as we've heard from Andrew Nikoforik and Angela, is uh, certainly uh, at the root of uh, the problems before us. It also comes with lots of costs and risks which are consistently being um, uh, underestimated uh, both because of the limits of science and uh, research um, and because uh, people uh, in the pro toil tar sands uh, camp are uh, co constantly using a stream of propaganda to uh, make us believe that they're being developed in a clean, responsible, and ethical manner. So I just, I'm just going to give you a quick example of which there are many in the book about h how this is playing out. And um, it has to do with uh, pollution in, in the water, which uh, Andrew t mentioned a, a little bit and al alluded to. Um, uh, this is the boilerplate. Uh, message we get from our leaders. Uh, this is Premier Stelmack talking to members of the U.S. Congress uh, about uh, in 2008, uh, telling them that any pollution in the river was naturally occurring and uh, was a result of um, bitumen underlying the uh, surface water system. Uh, and that was in large part and this is where it gets tricky. He wasn't necessarily lying because his monitoring program was telling him that that, that was the case. Well, David Schindler, who I'm sure most of you know, uh, couldn't, had a hard time believing that. And uh, he, uh, I think this was in an interview with me, he, he said, it's watershed science 101. If the oil sands were free of pollution as the greenwashers claim, it would be equivalent to an immaculate conception. <laughs> so he took it upon himself to raise the money uh, from private sources to uh, do uh, an, a quick and dirty experiment up in the tar sands to figure out if indeed uh, um, the extraction and upgrading of bitumen was or wasn't uh, polluting. And he found that it was, as I'm sure most of you know. Uh, he re uh, released his results in two papers in PNAS along with his colleagues, uh, Kelly, and I can't remember the other fellow's name, and they found uh, 13 priority pollutants um, that are toxic at low concentrations uh, in the snow and the water in the oil sands region. And this is uh, former Environment Minister Renner, who, uh, before he'd even read the report, but was descended upon by the media uh, in response to this, said, I don't believe that's what the study said. There are compounds in the Athabasca River that are naturally occurring and have been there for thousands of years and will always be there because of the nature of the geology in that area. More recently, uh, you may have heard in the media, and this isn't in my book because my 
we had to we had to draw a line at some point and actually publish the damn thing. So uh, it's hard to keep up to date. But uh, more more recently, uh, we've learned that federal scientists uh, have conducted their own research in 2011 uh, about whether tar sands uh, industry is um, polluting the uh, land and water in the area. And they don't know, not only corroborated Schindler's results, but found that uh, the toxins were actually further downstream and uh, in, um, were found in uh, lake sediments or sediments at the bottom of lakes in an area four times bigger than what uh, the study area that Schindler and his colleagues used. But did we hear anything about that? No. It wasn't until an ATIP request by uh, uh, Mike D'Souza, who I think should be um, given the Order of Canada, if not sainted, for all the work he's done ferreting out these private documents that are uh, continually kept for us, from us, um, found that um, scientists were allowed to present, th these scientists were allowed to present uh, their data at a toxicology uh, conference in California, um, but that they weren't allowed to talk to reporters about their results. And um, they were to uh, send any, any media inquiries to the Harper's um, communication people. Uh, and one of the, uh, so there was a, a list attached uh, of the stock answers that uh, they were going to provide. And uh, one of the stock answers was re researchers had tested the toxicity of the Athabasca River water in the spring of 2010 with negative results. And... The, the problem with science is that this, I, this could, could possibly be true. It depends on how you define toxic. It depends on when you test the water. It depends where you test the water. But it's certainly um, a selective use of facts, which is uh, a primary uh, strategy uh, for uh, propagandists. And uh, in, there's a, I'll, I'll get to that later. So I'm constantly monitoring the websites of the Alberta government, the federal government, and the Canadian Association of Petroleum Producers, which is the mouthpiece for the oil and gas industry here in this country. And uh, since I've started looking at this, for, it was, it's been almost three years now, they've never put anything on their website about uh, the, the results of Schindler's research or, or now um, the uh, research of the federal scientists, which I guess is fair because nobody knew about it until just recently. P Peter Kent did, but he, f he forgot to mention it in any of his speeches. And, um, and so they're uh, telling, uh, using uh, a variety of propaganda strategies, which I'll talk a little bit more in a minute, but they're, they're telling us half-truths and selective truth. So the reason I got inspired to write this book is because somebody, well, Bob Gibson at the University of Waterloo wrote a column in Alternatives Journal about this little book called On Bullshit by Harry Frankfurt. And I use bullshit a lot in my book because, because of this book, it gave me a, a great academic foundation for being able to use the word bullshit. <laughs> and um, and uh, he wrote this little book about 20 years ago uh, as, a, as a, an essay in a, an academic journal because he was really concerned about the prevalence of uh, misinformation and propaganda in our society, and more importantly, the fact that we seem to be okay with that, 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 that it's become so, so much a part of our culture that nobody even questions it anymore. And uh, so he, he, wrote, he wrote this little book, and it really inspired me because I was like, man, this is, this is what's going on in, in, in Canada and with, with the oil sands. So it was in part um, because of, of this little book, which I would suggest that all of you read, um, that I wrote my book. I'm just going to, I think it's important that we understand a little bit about the history of propaganda, because it's, it's a word that, that we tend to associate with, associate with autocratic regimes in other parts of the world, but it's really uh, the reason we do that is because it's so embedded in our culture that we don't even know that it's going on around us. And um, uh, this is Edward Bernays, and he, he, the quote here, if you can't read it, is the, the conscious and intelligent manipulation of the organized habits and opinions of the masses is an important element in democratic society. 
those who manipulate this unseen mechanism of society constitute an invisible government, which is the true ruling power of our country. This was, a, he wrote this in 1928. He's, he's generally regarded, uh, him and another fellow named Lee, as the father of, of public relations. His book was called Propaganda, but, and it was about public relations, uh, but the softer term public relations is the one we, we now use today. And his work was uh, inspired the Nazis and, and, the, and Stalin um, to use propaganda as a fundamental tool in their bids to uh, take over and reform their particular societies. And what, one of the most famous um, stories about Bernays was he was asked by um, George Washington Hill, uh, the president of the American Tobacco Company, to help him figure out how to sell cigarettes to women because at that time, uh, in 1929, it was really socially unacceptable for women to smoke. And so they were like, hey, uh, half the population can't buy cigarettes, so that's a problem. So what um, Bernays did is he got a, a bunch of beautiful models to, uh, to march in a New York uh, parade. And then he went around to the media and he said, you know what? I've heard that there are a bunch of m famous models are marching in this parade and they're going to whip out cigarettes as a protest against the fact that women can't uh, smoke. Well, he'd set this all up, and then he arranged for photographers to be in the right place at the right time so that when they whipped out their cigarettes and lit up, that um, uh, they could get photographs, and then he, used, he sent the photographs all over the world, and it was a huge, big story. And uh, almost on a dime, women could smoke. And so uh, uh, I think uh, the percentage of uh, smokers went as high as 33% that were women over the ensuing decades and, until it peaked in the 70s and has dropped off a little bit. But uh, yeah, it was a brilliant, he was a brilliant man. Uh, he, he, he came to regret that particular um, uh, fiction once um, it became clear that cigarettes killed people, but uh, he did all sorts of other uh, less safe, less every things too. So most of you are familiar with George Orwell, um, author of 1984 and Animal Farm, uh, was a, you know, one of the, our, I think, uh, greatest, well, Britain's greatest social critics and I think uh, the world's greatest social critics. But he was large, he wrote a lot about propaganda and, and, the, and the use of language and other means of communication to manipulate populations of people. But he, he was mostly concerned with, um, with uh, totalitarian states. Uh, and he, it wasn't that he didn't think that could happen in Britain. And of course, 1984 is a, a novel of, 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 of that very thing. But uh, he, there's no indication that he, he conceived of it ha um, happening in a healthy democracy. Um, and, uh, but Noam Chomsky, Noam Chomsky did. He said, the 20th century has been characterized by the growth of democracy the growth of corporate power and the growth of corporate propaganda as a means of protecting corporate power against democracy. And in fact, where we find the best propaganda is, is in, in fact in, in, in um, capitalist democracies. Because the Soviet Union uh, and China, they have military force to back up uh, their propaganda and so it can be pretty crude. Um, I lived in Hungary for a number of years after the wall came down and everybody in Hungary that I talked to saw through the facade of the propaganda that was going on, but there wasn't a whole lot they could do about it because they knew that the Soviet army would come in and crush any resistance. Whereas in a democracy, it has to be much more sophisticated, much better funded uh, in order to, um, to work. And so this is one of the primary strategies I talk about in the book. There's many, and I can't cover them all here today but this notion of manufacturing doubt. And uh, there's a great book by Naomi Oreskes and Eric Conway, if you're interested. Um, uh, the, and the title comes from a famous but anonymous memo that came out of the um, investigations into the tobacco industry's um, uh, propaganda campaign to uh, avoid public knowledge of the risks of smoking and to continue to promote uh, cigarettes as a healthy um, pastime. And the, the quote from the anonymous um, source 
uh, and this they were this is part they were strategizing about how to you know how how to create a reality that would continue to allow people to buy cigarettes and of course now we know that it doesn't even really matter because people still buy cigarettes uh, we'll get to that a little later um, but the, the, the quote is, the means of establishing a controversy, if we are successful in establishing a controversy at the public level, there is an opportunity to put across the real facts about smoking and health. And this has been used um, su successfully uh, in the tobacco wars, in the campaign against DDT, ozone depletion, acid rain, climate change, skin cancer, and Armenian genocide, among many others. And I think most of us are probably familiar with um, the uh, strategy to create doubt around climate change that's been going on for 20 years, funded largely by the oil and gas industry, particularly Exxon and the, and the Koch brothers. Um, and it continues today. Just go to the Heartland Institute website. So in uh, Tipping Point, the documentary about the tar sands, uh, the ever outspoken, another man who should be sainted, uh, David Schindler. I dedicated my book in part to him. Uh, you know, he recognizes all this. He said, it's a stand standard industry tactic. Every year that you get away with lack of regulation is a few billion more bucks in your pocket. After 40 years, I'm pretty sick of seeing this tactic fool people time after time. And he, he, he was involved in the acid rain and, and ozone debates uh, back, uh, well, when I was five years old. So, I mean, we've heard from Nick Aforic and Angela about the fact that there's no question that we live in a, a petrol state. And Andrew uh, did sort of allude to the fact that there's misinformation and propaganda go going on. But it's a very concerted effort, and um, and uh, Harper and the Alberta government, and I detail this more in my book, but have um, borrowed the guidebook from the Republican Party or the you know, the, the right wing conservatives in the United States, and they they just simply create reality. So, and, but they're very smart about it, and unfortunately, human beings are very uh, have a predilection to being taken in by um, uh, propaganda, which Bernays knew. Bernays actually was the nephew of Sigmund Freud, and it was his conversations with his father that led him to believe or to understand how public relations could be so powerful. And I think it's pretty, pretty clear over the last 80 years that it, it, it has been pretty powerful. So they, uh, the, the process is, is pretty simple. Um, industry and um, governments, they, they, they pull us to understand um, what we want and what, what we believe in, so sort of the myths about ourselves and what our values are. And then they ask us what we, what we want, and the polls are pretty clear that Canadians want, um, depending on which poll you look at at which time, but uh, that they, they want the, environment, the oil sands to be developed in an environmentally responsible way. They want uh, the environmental risks and costs to be min minimized, and some polls even show that a uh, vast majority, even in Alberta, at this point, would like a moratorium on the oil science sands till we get the monitoring program set up and we get some better science to understand what the impacts are. Well, these industry and government aren't really concerned with um, the facts. They just tell us what we want to hear, which is why we are just constantly bombarded with messages that say we're developing the oil sands in a clean, responsible, sustainable, ethical way, uh, which is rubbish, but they don't really care whether it's true or not. They just keep telling the public. Um, they also manufacture doubt, uh, which is, is about, say, pollution and um, there's various ways that they do that by telling us that they're going to restore everything at the end, uh, that there's no that there's no problems that they they have uh, they have it all figured out, and that technology ultimately w will save the day. So they create reality despite evidence to the contrary, which is very similar to what totalitarian states do. Media confusion or collusion. Um, Herman and Chomsky all had this to say about the media. Effective and powerful ideological institutions that carry out a system supportive propaganda function by reliance on market forces, internalized assumptions, and self censorship, and without overt co coercion. 
this is the modern media, sort of the, the concentrated media that are businesses first, corporations first and foremost, and purveyors of information lastly. Just one little anecdote. Uh, I, I think the media has failed us in this regard. Um, I wrote a column for Fast Forward calling bullshit on the uh, oil and gas industry for uh, misinforming us and just it was kind of a summary of what my book was going to be about when it came out. And Cap, um, uh, Jan Janet Annesley, the vice pres president of SPIN at CAP, r uh, wrote a long letter to the editor of uh, just boilerplate nonsense to contradict what I had said and publish it in Fast Forward. Well, the Globe and Mail actually turned her letter to the editor into a story in the Globe and Mail, and the headline was, uh, Oil Industry Calls BS on Critics. So apparently, so apparently writing a book that deep that details painstakingly about the, the misinformation that's going on in the um, oil sands debate uh, is not news and the, and the media has not ever, as, uh, at least the mainstream media, uh, written anything meaningful about the fact we're being lied to and misinformed, uh, decided to print uh, Cap's letter to the editor as a news story, but calling bu bullshit on the industry apparently isn't news. So there's, so as I was doing all this research, I, I started um, reading a, a lot of science and social science mostly about why, why is it? Because I kept asking myself, how is it that this can happen? I grew up in this country, it's supposed to be all these good, polite, honest Canadians that believe in, 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 um, in equality and justice and fairness. And um, it, it, it just seemed like we either believed in a myth that wasn't true or had totally gone off the rails. And there's a growing body of research that really indicates that s facts don't play a huge role in the way people make decisions. It's hard for, I know, a lot of people in, uh, in this room probably uh, to believe that, but uh, there's a growing body of research that indicates that, in, especially in complex and contested issues, um, that we're uh, not rational beings, but we're emotional beings capable of rationality, and that we actually make decisions based on uh, what we want the answer to be rather than what the answer actually is. And there's, um, you know, a couple of examples are motivated reason reasoning and optimism bias, uh, and I'm running out of time, so I can't get into them, but they're in my book. And so the cartoon is, is a truck that says oil-based economy and the little man with the stop sign is saying, there's a dead end and a really deep ravine up ahead. And the truck driver says, it's a hoax, dead ends don't exist. <laughs> and, th and this leads to ideological pathology. So it's f for the muddy middle, it, it, we kind of throw our hands up I think most of us, and you know, I use my family as a, who are great people as as sort of barometers for mainstream um, uh, thinking and behavior. And even with me and the family, they're they're pretty mainstream. And uh, but this fellow takes the case. This is Richard Kinder, CEO of Kinder Morgan, and he said, "I think that for any of our lifetimes, fossil fuels are going to be the primary source of energy in this world. When you talk the shale plays, we have at least a hundred years of supply." I'm a huge believer in the genius of mankind, and I think we'll continue to find new ways to utilize, explore for, and produce more and more fossil fuels. This, this is dangerous thinking. This, these, these people are dangerous people, and um, uh, are, are, if they continue to have their way, we're, we're gonna be in deep trouble. One thing that wasn't mentioned about the IEA report, um, uh, I assume all of you were there to hear Andrew Nikoforik, um, first of all, it doesn't say that America is going to be en energy independent by 2020 what it, or 2030. What it says is that North America will be energy independent by 2020, and that is in large part because oil production is going up in the U.S. and, um, and because uh, the modeling shows that tar sands uh, production is going to go up. But what the IEA report also said was that if we're going to keep the climate from warming any more than two degrees Celsius, we're going to have to leave two thirds of the oil company's reserves in the ground, or we're uh, pretty much guaranteeing a 3.6 to 6 degrees Celsius rise in global temperature. 
which um, is essentially going to parboil the planet and uh, create all kinds of not only environmental but uh, geopolitical and social problems. It, it would be, I think, a propagandish of me not to talk about the environmental community. The mar I know, environmental community also uses um, uh, propaganda as well. Um, but as I say in my book, and there's a huge debate about this because en environmentalists, and I've worked for lots of environmental organizations, and uh, I do think that they do have a concern with the truth, but they're, they're also in the, um, in the business of persuading people. And if we take, if we, if we believe the scientific research about how people make decisions and we understand that it's not based on facts, then continuing to uh, use only facts as the basis of our persuasion is, uh, well, it's a, it probably satisfies the definition of insanity. So I think the, the only point I'd like to make here is that, that environmental groups are becoming more and more sophisticated and using their own PR techniques. And I do think you can use PR with integrity and, um, and still be honest and, and factual. And, but I think this is in, an important part of being successful. This is Harry Frankfurt on um, the John Stewart Show. And uh, he, he basically says that bullshit is a more insidious threat to society because it undermines respect for the truth. It therefore undermines our commitment to the truth. And I think this pernicious problem is as or more important than the environmental degradation that uh, the continuing exploitation of fossil fuels causes. Because if we don't get a handle on this, um, then it just throws, leaves the door wide open for uh, the continued manipulation of uh, the citizenries in uh, democracies. So we've come, we, we're, we're in a, we're, we live in a world um, where war is peace and dirty is clean. Uh, war is peace is um, Orwell's phrase, and I just added dirty is clean to his list because this is a, a, a secret memo. Thank you again to um, the journalist whose name I can't recall right at the minute. Yeah. Collateral damage from Canada's booming oil sand sector may be irreversible, posing a significant environmental and financial risk to the province of Alberta. And for some reason, CAP and the federal government haven't put that on their website. <laughs> Thank you.